Good afternoon and welcome um, to our diversity talk today, this beautiful Wednesday. We got a little bit of rain here in Turlock, uh, which is always good medicine. Uh, we welcome all of you today to our diversity talk with the topic border thinking. Uh, we're excited, very excited to host today's featured guest, uh, Dr. Enrique Sepulveda, which we'll introduce in just a second. My name is Carolina Alfaro and I'm the director for the Warrior Cross-Cultural Center here at Stanislaus State. And before we begin, I just wanna take a brief moment to pause and to acknowledge that our campus sits on unceded Yoka traditional territory. We honor those that came before us. We honor those that still live amongst us. And as some of you may know, our campus Stanislaus was actually named after a warrior chief a Yokut Indian, Estanislao. And Estanislao, according to some of our local elders who are descendants of the Yokuts, um, recognized him as someone who was a peaceful hunter, a peaceful hunter and gatherer in this region. And so today we just wanna take a moment to express our gratitude to the Yokut peoples and the Natotomy tribes of this region for taking care and protecting these lands prior to our existence, prior to these establishments. And so um, before we continue a little further, I'm gonna pass it over to Paulette Hernandez. Thank you, Caro. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Paulette Hernandez and I am the Undocumented Student Services Coordinator. And today um, we are excited about um, the presentation and on the behalf of the undocumented student services, as well as the liberal, liberal studies and teacher education department, the alum, alumni engagement office and the doctoral program of, in education leadership. We want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, since today is a tea, uh, uh, diversity tea talk, uh, we would like to ask you to share with us what type of tea you're drinking or coffee uh, the flavor um, or any type of medicine that it might uh, have for us um, and you want to share. So please feel free to uh, share with us on the chat. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you, Paulette. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Enrique Sepulveda. Dr. Enrique Sepulveda currently serves as the assistant professor to the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is a scholar of Latinx communities in the Americas, Central and North, as well as in Europe, Spain. His people and ancestors come from what is now labeled the Texas-Mexican border. Both of his parents and grandparents were migrant laborers and followed the crops since before World War II. Early in his career, he was a bilingual teacher and school principal in California, Mexican farm working communities, including the labor camps here in our region. Enrique has been studying and engaging with Latinx migrants, everyday worlds, their neighborhoods, schools, and their contested conflictual relationships with Western liberal nation states that at once demands and extracts their labor while dehumanizing them in the process. Enrique is interested in documenting how Latinx migrants negotiate, contest, and co-opt global, structural, and racial forces. Some fun facts about Dr. Sepulveda is that he's a Stan State alum who graduated somewhere in the late 80s, the <laughs> Warriors. He was an organizer at heart during his time here at Stan State. He was president of the student club Mecha. He ran for student body president back in the day and was also one of the students who organized campus petitions to bring back soccer to our campus. 
Now, whether or not that was intramural or the official soccer team, we'd be interested to know. <laughs> Lastly, he was founder of the unofficial um, fraternity called the Lengua Lengua or something to that effect, <laughs> which helped create a sense of belonging for the few male students on campus during that time. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sepulveda when I was in middle school. He was my older brother's roommate in college and without realizing, realizing it at the time, he was already influencing younger Chicanos and Chicanas like me to attend college. So with that, I say thank you for being here today, Dr. Sepulveda, and I now pass the mic over to you. So thank you very much, Carolina. Yeah, I remember Carolina was, what, what did you say, eighth grade? Um, she was a young whippersnapper actress, I remember the theater skits in your backyard in between the Conjunto and Carne Asadas in, back in Planada. Um, thank you so much, Carolina, for your invitation. Um, it, it's such a great honor and pleasure for me to, I, I wish we could do this live. I wish COVID was dead and gone. I wish I could be there to walk the old halls of, of of the special place, Stanislaus State University. Um, it's, it's a place where I came of age. Um, it's a place where uh, they marked a key point in my intellectual, cultural history. Um, I, I, it was a place of renaissance for me, a, a major transformation, both at San Joaquin Delta College as a, as a, uh, a community college student who transferred to Stanislaus State. Those both institutions um, have been critical and fundamental for my, for my, um, my growth. Um, so thank you for this invitation. Um, I want to just acknowledge, um, my, uh, the, the land here in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, the, the, the land of the Arapaho and the Ute and the Cheyenne peoples, as well as, uh, 48 other tribal nations that, that claim, um, this homeland, um, so I want to acknowledge them and honor them um, as well. Um, I also want to invite my ancestors because any talk, any personal talk, any, any conversations about um, my intellectual ideas, uh, my cultural um, theoretical um, insights come from the, my people. Um, and so I, I want to <clears throat> uh, invite them to this space, um, uh, Los Antepasados. Um, so you can honor me that. Um, I want to just acknowledge some my familia, my brother, my prima Perla, my sobrino Salvador who are here. I don't know who else is here from my from my from my uh, peeps from Stockton, Modesto area. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, also there's some people here that I Ken Evans, um, Anicia from back in the day um, at UC Davis Woodland, um, so much. I, this is you're bringing a big smile to my face, just ha knowing that you're there. So, so it's been a long time. So, um, thank you for coming. Um, I, you know, I, at Stanislaus State, I was, I was like Carolina said, um, I was the one that started the soccer team, the 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 CU. Actually, let me rephrase that. I restarted that. I started the petition because when I got there, I wanted to play soccer. I was the captain of the soccer team at San Joaquin Delta College and I wanted to continue to play. So I, uh, Al Seiko, um, I talked to him, I talked to the president of the college and, um, and they say, start a petition, see if, you, if there's some uh, uh, interest. And sure enough, there was enough interest and we got the soccer team going again. So that's the uh, varsity soccer team. Javier Mercatnal also played for them after I left. Um, and we did we did a lot of we have, did a lot of important things at San Jose State. We, we we organized youth conferences, and we invited um, high school high schoolers from from the local high schools in Livingston um, and the Delhi Delhi and surrounding areas to come. And we we organized workshops, brought in speakers. We did a lot of good stuff, and, and it was a major um, um, place of activism and growth for me, as I said earlier. Um, so I just want to. Acknowledge my compas who were my, my partners in crime there, Panzas, Juan Mesa, um, my brother Javier, Timo Torres, Rogelio Gutierrez, and, and a whole lot of other people that were instrumental for 
for our work there that we did. Um, um, both pressuring the university to open up programs, bilingual programs, we pressured the university um, to create um, uh, diversity programs, uh, to bring in uh, more diverse staff. This was, we're talking the mid eighties, mid to late eighties. Um, and I remember we used a quote by Dr. Keene, injustice anywhere affects justice everywhere. Um, and the injustice of lack of representation was a major uh, point of struggle for us as students, which was informed by the larger Chicano struggle and the United, larger United Farm Workers struggle, as well as, a, as well as a civil rights struggle, indigenous struggles uh, for self-determination. Um, those were influential um, pieces of readings and, and, um, and influences in my life, not to mention the, uh, the Latin American post the revolutionary struggles and the post-colonial st struggles in Africa. I was reading all this stuff at the time at Status All State um, uh, and just growing intellectually in terms of my ideas of, of what it meant to be Chicano, Mexicano in the Central Valley. Um, so, um, so thank you, gracias. Um, I wanna start off with a couple of, 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 of anecdotal pieces um, that I've been going back to um, in my work. I'm, I'm right now working on a series of essays, critical essays, growing up Chicano in Southside Stockton, um, uh, learning English as a second language. Um, so I'm going back in, to kind of uh, unpack and, and, and um, reclaim and e erase histories in my own personal life and, and to connect them to larger historical global um, um, forces. Um, and one of those was in the second grade in, in Victory Elementary in Stockton, California. Um, I didn't know very much English. And I remember my parents telling me um, when we got to Stockton, it was in the first grade we got to Stockton, uh, midway, my parents said, Allí no hablan español, mijo. There at the schools, they don't speak Spanish. And I remember as a little kid looking up at my parents, you know, and my brother can attest to this. I always did kind of a squinty eye look. Y papi, por qué no hablan español allí? You know, I had no idea what, what was what's happening. I'm just like, why would they even speak Spanish? You know? And I remember coming home one day and asking my papi, um, and I said, papi, ¿qué significa wet buck? What does wet back mean? I can't even say the word. I said wet back or something like that. Que significa wet back? Because the kids were lobbying them at me. Um, as they lobbied, as they lobbed other other words like beaner. I remember throughout my childhood, beaner, wet back, burrito maker, taco bender. Um, and the irony here, and when I go around talking to groups of teachers around the country, um, one of the things I, I say to them is that as long as I didn't know English, I was protected. Spanish Mexicano identity was my protection, was my shield. I didn't know this at the time, obviously, but as long as I didn't know English, I didn't know what those words meant, so they couldn't touch me. And I come home and, and telling my, asking my papi, ¿Qué significa estas palabras como wetback? What, is, what does these words mean? And I remember, I remember my pops looking away at the moment of, of me asking that question. And it was almost as if he was in a faraway place, remembered something else. He would never tell me what that something else was. And I, I remember looking at, him, I was six, six years old. I'm like, is he not listening to me? And just about to, when, I, when I was gonna ask him again to re repeat the question, he's, he comes back to me, he said, no importa lo que diga la gente de nosotros. I'm sorry, I get choked up here. Um, he goes, no importa lo que diga la gente de nosotros. Somos gente decente, honesta y trabajadora. We are honest, decent, hardworking people. And, it, and, it, and that would stick with me and it would stick in my craw for until this day. Because my father knew that out there, the special hate that they had for Mexican people was a very real thing. And so unbeknownst to me, and I never got a chance to ask my dad as an adult, and he never got to see me graduate, but I wish so much that I could ask him, 
Pops, why did you say that to me? <clears throat> but I imagine that he had experienced as a farm worker that, that special hate that now his children, as, they, as we were starting to grow up, they would have to deal with that. And my father would constantly show his pride. And, and the pride I suspect was a way to, to reclaim our sense of humanity because um, as I learned English, I then had to negotiate the hate, the learning those, what those words meant. And that, at that point, and this is the irony because English is, gets, gets deployed by teachers and educators and framed as a good thing. And I'm not saying that's not a good thing. It's an important thing. We must learn English. We should learn English. But what my teachers didn't know is that I also had to negotiate hate in the process of learning English. And that English as an integrating into the liberal Western liberal nation state also meant negotiating the hate and the hierarchies. And, and, and to do that as a six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old child was a daunting task. I know now, and my father, and my parents did their best, but my teachers had no clue. And so my teacher's prerogative was learn English fast, learn, hurry up and learn English. And they would say things to me, Enrique, porque no podía pronunciar Enrique. They would say, Enrique, and later on it became Ricky. Ricky, you have to learn English quickly. Hurry up, learn English. And, I, and, and I, you may not believe me, but I didn't learn how to read English until the midway through my third grade year. So I was in, in California schools, first grade, second grade, third grade. And for those of us who are in bilingual education or getting trained to be bilingual teachers, that makes sense. Two and a half years of to produce linguistic, actually the, the English production of words comes sooner, but the comprehension comes later. And so it was, it, but my teachers thought I wasn't uh, something was wrong with me. So they spent, sent me to speech therapy, speech therapy classes, the special classes, because I was late in, in reading English. Um, but, but I would later learn that my teacher's imperative to teach me to learn English fast and the hate in the playground were two heads of the same animal. The, the thinking of English only, English hurry up, English fast, and sacrifice your Spanish was part and parcel of the larger assemblages of, of what I now understand to be the colonial imperative of, of English hegemony as representing the nation state and to eliminate, to erase diversity and cultural, other cultural ways of being. And so, of course, I didn't understand any of that. So. The, the, the hate that was coming at me from the playground, the English only imperative from my teachers were two pieces in the larger set of assemblages of, of, of an education tied to a liberal order that attempted to eliminate um, the other um, from our midst. So it's not a question of how, not a question of whether we integrate the other, the immigrant other, the Mexican other, the urban other, the, the, the black other, the Muslim other, or the queer other. It's not a question of how, whether we not integrate, we integrate them into marginality. Because the sacrificing of language and identity and culture is a colonial project of, of integrating into marginality. Um, those that we deem to be um, the labor pool or um, um, what scholars call the lower rungs of society. Um, so I, in, in many ways, I, I say, and I'm writing in my book proposal for this project of essays, I encountered empire in the first empire. grade, in the second grade. grade. The second grade. Um, and so, and so um, um, those, those two, those two 
stories, the anecdotes of my elementary school in Stockton, California, were juxtaposed two other stories that were happening in my, in my own family. Um, one of those stories, uh, my mom would tell me years later <clears throat> that when I was about to be born, um, she was living in Piedras Negras, Coahuila, Mexico, um, on the northern border, bordering Texas. Um, my father was somewhere in Wisconsin picking sugar beets, and it was late in the in the crappy uh, the crop fields, and uh, my father hadn't returned from the from being gone all year long. In fact, he didn't even know that my mom was pregnant because he had left, I think, in late February. So again, the migrants leave South Texas, northern Mexico, and, and follow the crops up the California spine into Oregon, Washington, come down Idaho, into Utah, or sometimes into Colorado, and, and, and down to Texas by the end of the year. So when I was about to be born in October, my mom's water breaks, and she calls my tío Pepe, que la llevara al, al puente. So my tío Pepe takes her to the bridge on the Mexican side. My mom walks across the bridge, contractions and all. Um, and, I, and another uncle, I think it was my tío Mundo, I'm not exactly sure, it's my cousin um, Salvador, your grandfather, um, is waiting for my mom and takes her to the Maverick County Hospital in Eagle Pass, Texas. And I was born there an American citizen for all the obvious reasons. Um, and my mom would tell me the story later on. And as a youngster, I didn't really ask too many questions. I, I didn't think too much of it. But it was at Stanislaus State, as I became engrossed in Chicano, the questions of the Chicano movement, the Chicana feminists, the queer Chicanas like, like Ansaldúa, who were calling us to reclaim our, our stories and histories and, 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 and the experiences of our parents and grandparents and aunt, and ancestors, I began to ask my mom these questions. I go, tell me again that story about you crossing the border. And my mom would say things like, um, es que queríamos salir adelante. We wanted to get ahead. And it's not the same, getting ahead doesn't mean getting ahead of people. Because there's a, there's a capitalist US normative idea of getting ahead of others. Getting, salir adelante means to get ahead of a problem or un reto, or una complicación, a predicament in life to get ahead and to come out the other end, buenos y salvos, uh, sanos y salvos, or you know, um, uh, surviving that predicament, right? So, so saliendo adelante, but my mom also said, when I asked her those stories uh, in my young adulthood, she said, it was also a way to tell you and your brother Javier who we are as a people. You know, I mean, think about it. We are a people of struggle. We are people who overcome things. And, and so I had both of those types of stories in the school, hate and assimilation, and my mom talking about crossing borders. At the same time, my mom tells me this other story and she tells me that tu abuelita, mama mina, my, her mom, my grandmother, Mama Mina, buried your ombligo in her backyard. And I'm like, what? I'm tripping, right? I'm like, wait a minute, my ombligo is in her backyard? And so, so the story has it that in, in my family's tradition, my mom's side of the family, my ombligo is buried next to my mom's ombligo, who's buried next to her mom's ombligo, who's buried to her parents and her brothers and sisters, my great grandparents and, and, great, and uncles and aunts. So our ombligos are buried somewhere in this place that is now like a dental office, I think, uh, or a doctor office, the, the, the houses have been raised and there's um, offices there. So our ombligos are buried, the ombligos are umbilical cords, sorry about that. Um, my parent, I was the first generation to be born in a hospital and the hospital didn't allow my parents, my mom to take the whole umbil uh, umbilical cord and the placenta because the tradition is, which is an actually indigenous tradition to bury the placenta and umbilical cord in the earth to symbolize our relationship 
with the earth. It's, a, it's an indigenous, deep and in, ancient indigenous practice. Again, it goes back to these hidden histories and erased histories of our indigeneity and, and, and what's been lost in our drive towards progress and future oriented mentality. And so, so here in, in this one fell swoop, my mom's talking about crossing borders and also my grandmother burying my ombligo. And in that, in the mix of that is, is the, are the themes of ruptures and continuity. And, and, and those, those ideas would kind of sit with me and I'm now going back and unpacking the stories because ruptures and continuities are part of our everyday lives. And, and I'm now going back to those stories of mining um, um, those experiences because again, going, the schooling uh, uh, mandate was to rupture us completely from our past, from our cultural ways of being, from our sense of history, our sense of groundedness. So in many ways, our children grow up in this, in this kind of no man's land of between the pole of not yet and the pole of no longer. We are no longer what we were in the past and we are not yet what we're supposed to be through our assimilation of schooling. So we are caught in this kind of between the poles of not yet or no longer. And, and what my work has shown uh, between a past um, that is very present and a present that hasn't revealed itself completely. Um, and um, and Ansaldúa, Gloria Ansaldúa, the iconic Chicana queer feminist uh, uh, thinker and philosopher tells us um, that, that that's part of the colonial wound. That's what the colonial imperial Western uh, project was about is to move, remove us from our land, erase our histories, erase our, our groundedness, our, our, our roots to turn us into a capitalist project of, of, of profit and exploitation and dispossession. Um, I've, that's what I've come to learn. I mean, that Stanislaw State was was a, 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 had, had the seeds of of, of that. Uh, I remember walking Stanislaw State, and um, um, uh, there's a one, there was one class, philosophy class, that I I can't remember the professor, but um, the professor ends the class one day early after talking about the allegory of the cave, Plato's allegory of the cave, and I'm like. I need to, I, I said to myself in class, I need to think more about the allegory of the cave. And I remember um, the professor ending the class and, and my Chicano buddies were like, they look at me and they don't you dare ask a question about though, because we, we got to get out of here. <laughs> He's going to end the class earlier. And I look at them and I, I got a burning question. And they're looking at me, they're like killing me with their eyes. Don't ask a question. And I look at him and I'm like, and I asked, and I asked the professor, I, I, I need you to tell me more about this allegory of the cave. Because if you know, you know, just a quick allegory, the shadows that the fire projects on the, on the walls in the allegory of the cave was that that was a, 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 the perception, an unreal perception for the individual. So coming out of the cave and not, um, realize, and realizing that that the that the that the cave was a, 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 a socially constructive uh, place uh, that wasn't real um, for me. That's that's what edu U.S. education was. In other words, the cave for me, for as a Chicano, as I was grappling with the educational project in the U.S. was Plato's cave, and that's what I was trying to work out. Um, in, in, in these classes at Seven Saw State. My buddies were like, dude, let's go to hang out and get a beer, get some burgers, come on. Um, and I would walk with the professors after the class because I said, I, I need to learn more about this stuff. 
And so I guess the, the lesson for that, and for those of you who are students right now, is curiosity is key. Intellectual curiosity is key to the, to the educational project. But combined with the ed educational project was for me as I need to think about how this fits in, in terms of my Mexican border, re, border crossing reality. Um, and I would come later to, I would later, later learn that, um, that the, there were Chicanas feminists who, who were theorizing outside of the Western gaze. So while I tell students, I said, yeah, we, yeah, we should read Montesquieu and Hume and Locke, you know, with the enlightenment thinkers, but ultimately they, they don't have much to say to us. They, they can teach us how for us to negotiate the Western liberal social global order, but ultimately we need to go back to our community and learn through our experiences and theorize. And this is what the Chicano, Chicana queer feminist scholars and thinkers taught me and, and a whole generation of us. Um, it's, it's not coincidental that in the Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex um, um, intellectual tradition, the border, um, not just the physical political border or international border, but the symbolic border, symbolic crossing looms large because it, it's theorizing from our experience. I mean, if you look at, I mean, for, if you, you know, if you study black African women, it's not coincidental that black critical African American women gave us the idea of intersectionality. Because I mean, black women were saying, yeah, race is, a, race is, a, is something to contend with and there's gonna be theorizing thinking around that, but race as it intersects with gender and sexuality and these, I mean, it's not coincidental. They're theorizing and thinking from their own embodied experience, something that the enlightenment thinkers had no idea and can't even come close to. So, so my point in, in bringing up these stories is to, we need to think from our own embodied experience to theorize and think. And, and, and for me, that's, that was the Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s. And as I came to read them, appropriate them and critique them in the eight, mid eighties at San Francisco State was, was transformational for me. That was, that's what allowed me to, to, to get to the place where I am now. Um, there was a, there's a, a famous quote by Benjamin Franklin in 1760, 67, um, where he's talking about, I mean, this is even before the US is born. Um, and this is a few years after the British Empire had beat the French Empire in the Seven Years' War. Um, and this young colonial uh, place called the 13 Colonies were already looking into to take the land from indigenous people. But no sooner had that war ended with the French and the taking of lands of indigenous people near the Allegheny Mountains Benjamin Franklin was already talking about taking lands from the Mexicans. Um, there's a famous, uh, my, my go-to US historian is Greg Grandin. Um, and, and I have um, his book here, um, but it's kind of, um, I don't know if you can see, can you see it? Um, no, it's called The End of Myth. The End of the Myth um, uh, by Greg Grandin. Um, um, he's kind of my, he's, he's at Yale University, he's my go-to historian, one of my go-to historians. Um, and he's quote, and he's talking about how the intelligentsia of the 13 colonies, Ben Franklin being one of them, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they're, they're already thinking of taking the lands from the indigenous people and, and the Mexicans and the new Spaniards uh, of, of the South. And the argument was, that they were mongrelized people, or at least one of the arguments. They, that the, that the, the people who occupy what we now call Mexico and the Southwest were mongrelized people, later to be called feeble-minded in the 20th century. Um, when Chican, Chicanitos and Chicanitas will fail in school, the educational leaders would say, the reason that they fail in school is because they're feeble-minded, they're the product of 
too feeble-minded races. As I'm learning this, you know, um, I, 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 it, it goes back to the curriculum that I was exposed to. I, I wanna share an image. Um, I know I have about nine minutes. I wanna share an image um, that, that happened to me in the seventh grade uh, that was shown to me as a seventh grader. So um, Carolina, is there a way to, um, can I share? Okay, let me share a screen with you. Um, let me pull that up uh, if you give me a second here. Um, okay, I got it. Let me just share it. So can you, you all see that? It's a painting, it's called Dawn at the Alamo. Um, and, I, and I zoomed into this very specific uh, portion of, of the Battle of the Alamo. I'm in my seventh grade class. My family moves back to South Texas. Um, my little sister passed away. We wanted to be close to familia. So my, my parents take us back to Texas. So I'm in the seventh grade history class. And the teacher who was very old white woman She's proceeded to teach this class full of Mexicano kids about the Battle of the Alamo. And we're sitting there and she projects this image of the painting and she focuses on this little portion of the picture. And it's, it's this heroic figure of Colonel William Barrett Travis, the leader of the Texans who are rebelling against the Mexican government. And, and the teacher zeroes in on the character right behind who's about to stab the heroic William Barrett Travis in the back. And, she, and, she's, and she's using this image as if it was fact to teach us Mexican kids why the white race was superior, why Americans needed to take these lands from the Mexicans and the indigenous peoples. And she said, and she, I'll never forget this. She said, look at the, 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 vermin looking Mexican who doesn't have the courage to, to fight William Barrett Travis in the face in front of him. But he's gonna, he rather, he's a coward about to stab him in the back. And I'm sitting in class and all the Mexicanos were like, and it's all Mexican, Mexican Americans or recently arrived Mexicanos. And I remember one Mexicano kid goes, ay cabrón, nos van a comer vivo aquí. We're gonna be eating eating alive here in class. And the teacher was on us. She was sage on the stage. She was um, drilling this into us. And I remember just in my, just kind of shrinking and just kind of trying to hide because we Mexicans were portrayed as the subhuman vermin-like other. This, this was my experience, people. This is, this, is, this is what I grew up. So, I grew up with, in California schools and in Texas schools, two different school systems. Both were bent on erasing and dehumanizing us in different ways. And so, so part of the questions that I have is, is how, how a Western liberal social order integrates us into its social order um, and at what cost. Um, the, the, um, um, the, the readers and the thinkers that I, that I, that I um, uh, you know, follow and, 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 and use in my work um, tell us that it is that, that colonial wound of not belonging, that colonial wound of dehumanization, of othering, is our source of liberation. It's a, it's a, it's a paradox. It's, kind of, it's like, it's not commonsensical. What do you mean? Okay, so that place of no longer and not yet, where the past is very present, but the present hasn't revealed itself, where you're caught between contradictory linguistic, cultural, social systems, and you don't fit in any of them. That, that is the place of liberation, Ansaldúa tells us. She writes from a queer perspective because she, as a queer Chicana on the border, she says, I don't fit as a woman the way womanhood is defined. I don't fit 
as a, uh, an American, as the way American is defined or Mexican, Mexican is the way Mexicanos are defining it. I am caught in this border reality of crossing back and forth, but not belonging anywhere. And, and, and the, 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 the thinkers and communities are theorizing from that place of not belonging or partial belonging or, or, or incomplete belonging as the place to critique patriarchy, gender norms, racism, um, empire, colonialism. Um, and that's where, that's, that's where I do my work. That's where um, um, uh, I begin to, to think from. I wanna, I wanna just read, I wanna take a couple of minutes to just read a, a couple lines from my, from my book, um, um, page 49 in the first chapter, um, um, where I did my dissertation that in, at this high school in Northern California, you, those of you from, from the Davis Woodland area, you can probably guess where. Um, uh, and, and, and everybody's concerned about the Mexican students in this high school in Yolo County, because there's a malaise, there's a disconnect, there's underachievement, there's um, uh, students skipping classes at high absentee rates. And, and, and I'm looking at uh, at this reality and, and white teachers, but not exclusively white teachers, even some Chicano, Chicana teachers um, would, make, would make the argument, well, they need more remediation. They need more tutoring. They need more one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, all of those things uh, th that I just mentioned are classic public school educator frameworks and thinking. Their thinking comes out of their professional training. Um, what I write here, um, um, I, in, Mayela was a, uh, a security guard at this high school whose father's from Guatemala and, and mother's from Mexico, undocumented immigrants. So Mayela grew, grows up in this in-between space. Um, Mayela say, this is what I write about Mayela. Mayela, on the other hand, felt deeply and understood that what Mexican youth at Bosque High needed was not technical remediation. What they needed was passage and acompañamiento through their multiple border crossing worlds. The Mexican youth at 15 years ago when I did my dissertation were Global, globalization's exiles. They didn't need re remediation. Technical skills and content learning was not the issue. What the, what the issue was that they needed dialogue and accompaniment. And I say, right, I write, Mayela's ability to see, quote unquote, and feel, quote unquote, more deeply comes from a borderlands experience where all the person's human faculties are recruited to make sense of the world and the people around them. This is a classic Gloria and Sanduin um, concept of border gnosis um, where we intuit, we feel, we sense that something's not right here and it's not a technical thing as we educators tend to think. So dialogue about what it means to be a border crosser, dialogue what it means to be a, framed as a transgressor, what it means to leave Mexico or leave our Southwest and venture out to the world um, and negotiate a, a social order that is aiming to erase us. Um, it is those issue, existential issues that are fundamental to our intellectual, cultural um, uh, concerns. The technical pieces of reading, writing, content, mastery, skill development that we so um, cherish in the educational schools is secondary. We are, we are dealing with the colonial wound of erasure. And until we address that, the rest is, is gonna be meaningless. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. I, I could go on and on and on and talk about this though, but, um, but all to say, just to finish that, it is my experience as a Chicanito kid 
Mexicano kid of not belonging that ultimately has led me to, to think and theorize um, in the borderlands. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Sepulveda, for um, this very uh, educational uh, story, um, your personal story, and just kind of, you know, for me personally, it's just realizing that we still live in that middle, right, today, and there's so many of our youth um, in our Central Valley, for example, that still are trying to discover what that acompañamiento means for them. Yeah. So um, thank you for your story. We wanna you know, just honor the time that we have left and open it up for questions. So we're gonna ask um, our guest and um, if anyone here would like to you know, just ask a question, you can either use the chat, the reaction button to raise your hand or you can um, put your name in the chat and just say question and we're gonna go ahead and and open it up now. So, there's a lot of thinking going on. For sure, lots of uh, processing. I want to give a shout out to my compadre Rogelio uh, before I go back to work. <laughs> We have a comment in the chat box. Carolina, if you want to read it. A comment from Otilia, very moving and refreshes my awareness on how this impacts me as a young immigrant and how I influence others in my practice. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, we have a question from Dr. Montero Hernandez. So. <clears throat> Yeah, thank thank you for the for the conversation. I'm I'm particularly I'm, I found very interesting the 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 concept that you use about the colonial wound, and I would like to hear a little bit more about how how what are your thoughts around this this notion of trauma, right? And and how you're connecting trauma with the colonial wound, and at the same time, what is what is the role of trauma in in re-signifying the identity, re-signifying the experience? Part of the work that I have been doing uh, with with graduate students, it's um, it's a little bit about trauma, right? And how for many of them, uh, <clears throat> they have used that trauma to actually potentialize uh, their their skills, their interests, their 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 life mission, right? So I think that there is a lot of uh, growth opportunities uh, from, from the trauma, right? But how, how we help people to see trauma as, some, as a place that can inspire growth, right? So I, I want to hear a little bit about your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Virginia. That's, a, that's a, such an um, important area of study. I, I, it's not my area, I wanna be upfront. Yeah. Um, but, but because we are talking about multi-generational trauma here, um, um, I, you know, you know, I suspect that my, my, my grandmother, Mama Mina, um, and, and, you know, and the ancestors uh, engage in these kinds of practices to humanize ourselves. And you see this throughout our history of, um, um, uh, you know, through musica, through poetry, through um, even other forms of artistic expression to come to terms with um, uh, these, these different forms of trauma. Walter Mignolo, the Argentinian thinker um, who's at Duke University, who, who talks about the colonial wound, uh, um, you know, it, you know it, and he talks about the colonial wound not as, as something that happened in the past and, and we're just dealing with the legacy, but, but the rep repetitive, continuous forms of novel forms of, of trauma um, and dehumanizing practices. I mean, we, we, we tend to have in the United States, a kind of um, a celebratory multicultural uh, need 
or a need to do a celebratory multicultural framing of, of, of the colonial wounds to show that we were making progress. Um, uh, and, and some of it's symbolic, but, you know, we, you know, I think of the farm workers who had to work un, under extreme toxic environments, not just because of the pesticides, but because of the fires last year, if you recall, um, they had to breathe in this toxic air and also under pandemic conditions, right? So both pandemic, the fires, the pesticides, they're, they're, and they, because they were deemed to be essential workers. So this is, and this is the, this is what we have to zero in on that we are both, our peoples are both um, essential workers forced to work. Otherwise they get fired and can't feed their children and dehumanize populations at the same time, right? We are devalued. I mean, we are essential workers and devalued at the same time. And this is not in the past. This is now, right? Right now. And so, um, so when you know somebody said, I think it was Anissa said, we have a lot to work to do in Stockton. Part of it's the legacies of past practice, but it's also the re-traumatizing um, of 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 social conditions that get reproduced. I mean, if you think about, I mean, W. E. Du Bois the great African-American scholars in his book, in the first chapter of um, The Souls of Black Folk, he talks about, we thought that the abolition of slavery and emancipation was gonna be the, the motherland of freedom. It wasn't because new coercive labor regimes um, took the place of slavery. And then W.D. Bowles talks about, he says, well, and then they told us the ballot would be our form of emancipation and it wasn't. Then he said, then it became education. If we educate ourselves and become learned people, that would be our ultimate freedom. We're, so he's writing this a hundred years ago and, you know, and it hasn't come to pass. And so, um, so I think you know, your work in, in, in the studies of trauma need to be, I imagine are, are combined with not just historical forms of, of coercive labor regimes or oppressive conditions, but how those evolve over time to the present to look at coercive, oppressive regimes today and how they are causing dehumanizing processes and re-traumatizing, right? I look at, my work looks at how, how we, um, and I'm sure you look at this too, how we, um, attempt to humanize ourselves in our communities to overcome the debilitating efforts of trauma, right? So I think our work is complementary. Um, so I would love to continue that conversation with you. Thank you. And that was a kind of a long-winded way. Yeah, no, but, but I, I I think that it's, it's it's a good perspective, right? Like thinking that trauma is not something that just happened at one moment and then right. you just overcome that moment and you continue. The, there is this continual retro, retro, how do you say, like re-traumatizing experiences. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. it is important to keep thinking about how how that keeps being either overcome, overcome, but at the same time being it, it keeps affecting. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. We have room for maybe one more question or two quick questions. So we'll. There's a question in the chat um, from Jose Gutierrez. Um, your stories are very impactful. During your time at CSU Stanislaus, would you consider it as the best time of your life? I, I would consider it an important period of my life. Tavo, um, y saludos a la familia. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know if the best, I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty, um, uh, powerful framing, but I would say in a, in a significant moment in my, my life, um, uh, you know, my compadres that I are still my compadres that I learned that I became friends with, we, we still get together, we still talk. Um, and those relationships are important for me. I've lived in El Salvador, I've lived in, in Denmark, I've lived in Spain, I, part of my work is in Spain, and I'm looking at Latinx immigrant groups in Spain. Um, and I, and I have to say this, um, it is my Mexican experience of, of othering that 
makes me go to El Salvador and to look at Salvadoreño's experience who crossed three borders, who, who, who arrived here with $10,000 in debt already by the time they crossed three borders. Um, Central Americanos get maligned by Mexicans in Mexico and once they arrive here. Um, and I think that's important to, and I, I, I frankly don't understand it, although I've seen it over time and time, how Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Chicanas, Mexicanos malign other gente who have gone through similar experiences that we're going through of, of negotiating this global capitalist structure and racist forms of othering. Um, I, I want to bear witness to <clears throat> the children who've been caged at the border because we've been caged. Come on now. What's up with that? We need to recognize the humanity of children at the border who are not Mexicanos, but are other Latinx brothers and sisters who, who are going through this. And likewise, likewise, going to Spain and working with um, Latinx immigrant youth there um, from El Caribe, from South America, um, indigenous people from Bolivia. Um, also came in contact with Muslim communities from Morocco, um, um, Algeria, and engaging in conversation with Algerian Muslim youth who were caught in their own particular kinds of ways between European um, and Muslim um, cultural spaces. And so it is my experience as a Mexicano, as a Chicano that projects me um, out to the larger human condition. Um, um, and so the theorizing, so I consult with African scholars and Asian scholars and Latin American scholars, as well as progressive critical white, white scholars and queer scholars to understand, to kind of unpack our multiple intersectional world. So, um, so Stanis, to go back to Davos question, Stanislaw State was a, a seed that, that um, um, in, you know, developed over time in other places. Um, so, yeah. All right, and lastly, there's um, a comment uh, from Rogelio, which uh, states, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Supolveda, uh, compadre, I look forward to reading more of your critical essays research, uh, which is uh, vital to our youth in the Central Valley. Felicidades. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would add um, that we need to engage, not that I have the answers, or we as adults, or we as those of us who are citizens, versus undocumented, that we have the answers, but it's in the dialogue um, and, and in the poetic reconstruction of our narratives and our, um, um, you know, talk back or write back to, to the powers that be, to the largest society, um, that the answers and uh, the idea of acompañamiento comes out of that engagement, that dialogical engagement with, with young people on the margins of society. And, and the other thing is, you think of margins of society, the margin society is the center. We think of, that's the crazy thing is most of us are live on the on the margins, and it's at some point it ceases to be margins, and, and becomes a central feature of a capitalist liberal social order. One thing I learned in El Salvador in Spain by from the activists is that crisis is capitalism. Capitalism is crisis. In other words, capitalism thrives on on crisis. That's a whole nother talk that you can invite me another day, but, um, but thank you very much for, for giving me the space to talk about some of my stuff. Thank you, Dr. Enrique Sepulveda. Uh, we'll ask our guests to use their reactions if they would like to clap or <laughs> say thank you. Um, and thank you on behalf of our Warrior Cross-Cultural Center. Thank you to our Liberal Studies and Teacher Education Department, to the Alumni Engagement Office, and to the Doctoral Program in Educational Leadership, and our Undocumented Student Services for helping, um, you know, helping us co-host this event and for um, allowing us to host such a wonderful discussion today. Um, if you would like to learn more about uh, Dr. Sepulveda's um, books and works, um, he doesn't have a website. I kind of researched that, but um, feel free to cool. reach out. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us, and we can send you um, some information on where you can find his books. Uh, his recent one is Border Thinking, which I added the title there. 
Um, so we'll put our email in the chat and also feel free to send uh, fill out the survey and we are going to actually raffle off one of his books. Um, so um, feel free to do that. And once again, thank you. Thank well, you want, and have I, a wonderful I, rest of the afternoon. I wanna give a shout out to all the gray haired folks out there and to the those of us, those of you who don't have much hair, um, keep the faith. <laughs> Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Is that Armando Salazar from Livingston? <laughs> What's up, my brother? I'm just here working in Delhi, 30 years already. How are your, how's your kids and family? Uh, I, Bianca, remember Bianca? Yeah. She's, uh, she's 30 and she's got three kids. Wow. Yeah, she's uh, she's uh, uh, she's she's studying for a uh, uh, to be a speech pathologist. And then Ariana, Ariana, my youngest, she's a nurse at uh, Hogue Hospital in Southern California. Wow. Yep. Yeah, so we're still going on. So how's your family? Good. Good. Um, my I got re I remarried and um, yes. I have a uh, my daughter's twelve years old and running circles around me. <laughs> no, I bet. But next time, this hopefully later this summer, I'm gonna be in California. Let's let's connect. Let me know. I, I have your brother in Facebook, so let me know. And okay. Then, uh, okay. I will. I would love to get together with you. Yeah, for sure, brother. All right, man. Cuidate. Hey, nice, nice seeing you. All yeah, right. Man. Say hi to the family. I will. Okay, Carolina. Gracias por la invitación. I hope it was. Um, hope it went well. I mean. Usually I, you know, I'm just do, I do my thing and I can't on virtual reality. I don't know what the feel is, but. No, it was, <laughs> it was amazing and it was very heartfelt. And um, I think you related to a lot of the folks there. There was a good mixture. So we had uh, not only just generationally, but we had a mixture of faculty who are in teacher education, mm -hmm. uh, credential oh. students, we had, um, I saw a couple of school principals mm -hmm. and then we had um, some graduate students like that are non, not credential, but graduate mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. um, and a few staff members. Um, so it was a nice mixture Good. overall, Good. plus, you know, of course, you know, family, friends. Of course, yeah. Um, but it was very, very, it left me wanting to learn more about a lot of the concepts that you're discussing. So mm -hmm. I, you know, Maybe next year we can do a part two. <laughs> yeah, maybe, um, maybe I can come physically. Um, and, yeah, there was a few EDD students that are going into doctoral programs. Um, so it was great for um, us to kind of witness that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, overall, it was wonderful. Thank great, you. Great. Paulette and Andrea, I don't know if you guys want to add anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I was in and out trying to help out with logistics and answering emails from people that wanted to hop on, but I am so impressed. Um, I got my master's degree in higher ed, and yeah. my focus was, it, it was always first generation um, male students and why they couldn't finish. And um, in, in the end, we finished off with first gen um, students of color and the importance of persistence and um, everything that has to do with, um, I don't know, just every day, I can't even think right now, but it was amazing. <laughs> I got the opportunity to take ethnic studies classes as a minor. Um, do you know anybody at the Sacramento State University ethnic studies department by chance? Yeah, I, I, they're probably no longer there because when I was there, they were, yes, I'm viejitos. <laughs> Yeah. So there's probably um, a lot of new people. Oh. Yeah, I had Dr. Figueroa and she introduced us to um, Alcandua. And so yeah. she you know, had us read the book and everything. And yeah. that's when I was like, okay, like this is stuff that I'm really into. And thankfully, like Carolina shares so much with us and like everything. And, you know, just sitting here, 
you know, sipping my coffee and everything. Like it was just, it's really empowering to know that there's men out there that, you know, are still, you know, not only are they in education, but, you know, if, if there's any time where you can talk to, you know, mm. maybe our male success initiative. Sure, and, sure. You know, talk to yeah, them. For and, sure. You know, guy to guy talk, you know, <laughs> something like that. But exactly. That's really so excited. much, that's so needed. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank, you, thank you. Thank you for your words. Yeah. Of course, yeah. And I agree. I think it was great. Um, and I mean, it's just something that we haven't really spoke about um, on our campus. Um, so I think it was very refreshing for me to to hear it from a different perspective uh, than, you know, the, the undocumented experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for your work here. And also thank you for, for your words. Yes, and we um, actually um, put together a feedback form. So once we get a few comments, we'll email your way. Yeah, and, perfect. Um, and then I'm going to ask Andrea to just uh, connect with you for your mailing address because we perfect. have a little alumni gift that we want to send you. Um, so um, just stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Should I put my address in the yeah. chat, chat box? Or, or if it's easier, do it now. You know this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let me write it down. I'm going to stop recording, by the way.